Beto O'Rourke is a rising star on the national political stage. For many, his sudden ascension came out of nowhere. The three-term congressman from Texas gained nationwide attention during the 2018 midterm elections as his optimistic message and charismatic personality captured the hearts and minds of many in the Democratic Party hungry for new leadership. Although he would be narrowly defeated in a highly competitive race for the United States Senate against Republican Ted Cruz, Beto immediately emerged as a major player in the Democratic Party. The groundswell of momentum built during his Senate campaign has many likening the newcomer to the likes of Bobby Kennedy and Barack Obama. But exactly who is Beto O'Rourke? What are the defining moments in his life that have led him to where he is now? And is he the kind of leader the Democratic Party needs in 2020 to take back the White House from President Donald Trump? Born Robert Francis O'Rourke on September 26, 1972, the boy whose parents would give him the nickname Beto seemed destined for a career in public service. His mother, Martha, was the stepdaughter of Fred Korth, Secretary of the Navy under President John F. Kennedy. His father, Pat, served in El Paso as county commissioner and then county judge. His father also served as the state chairman of Jesse Jackson's 1984 and 1988 presidential campaigns. A self-described shy and awkward kid, a young Beto would accompany his father on campaign stops, which he initially hated, but later would come to appreciate as the foundation for his own career in politics. After graduating high school in 1991, Beto worked as a summer intern on Capitol Hill in the office of Congressman Ron Coleman. That fall, he went on to attend Columbia University in New York City, where he would major in English literature. No longer the shy kid that followed his father on the campaign trail, Beto was very active during his college years. In his junior year, he co-captained the Columbia heavyweight rowing crew. He would also perform in a band. Beto, along with a few friends, formed a rock group named Foss. The group would start their own record label and release a couple of records independently. During the summer, they would tour the US and Canada, playing shows for little to no money, just enough to pay for gas to make it to the next gig. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, making their first television here in El Paso, Texas. That is only singing scene. And they're only singing Sing debut. Give them a big hand. Oh, hey, guys, you doing tonight? Yeah. The band gained modest publicity in the El Paso area and even caught the attention of some established acts. He would later reflect on his music career with fondness, saying that it gave him the opportunity to see his country. Unsure about what to do after college, Beto worked a number of odd jobs in New York City, including for a moving company, a tech company, and even working as a nanny. The lack of stability and uncertainty about his future caused Beto to fall into a depression. He became fed up with life in New York City and began to miss his family and the lifestyle he lived back home in El Paso. In 1998, he purchased a vehicle on Long Island for $1,000 and made the 2,167 mile drive from New York City back to El Paso. Back home. Beto would co-found an internet services and software company named Stanton Street Technology. The company would also publish an online newspaper titled Stanton Street. 
wanting to come back and make a difference in his hometown. He became involved with organizations like the Rotary Club, United Way, and the Center Against Sexual and Family Violence. He also became a board member of the El Paso Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and a board member of the Institute for Policy and Economic Development at UTEP. In the early 2000s, Beto decided to enter public service after El Paso Mayor Ray Caballero lost his re-election bid after only one term. Caballero was an inspiring leader of the progressive movement in El Paso. Despite his defeat, Caballero's supporters became a strong force within El Paso politics. Beto, who believed deeply in the mayor's progressive platform, ran for the El Paso City Council in 2005. He ran on a slate that included Susie Byrd, attorney Steve Ortega, and former Caballero staffer Veronica Escobar. The slate became collectively known as the Progressives. He ran on a platform of downtown development and border reform. He defeated two-term incumbent Anthony Cobos 57% to 43%, becoming one of the youngest representatives to have served on the city council. As a councilman, Beto supported revitalizing parts of El Paso that had been economically depressed. He supported a resolution calling for a comprehensive examination of the war on drugs and the repeal of ineffective marijuana laws. Although the resolution was vetoed by then Mayor John Cook, it stirred up a larger national discussion on the failed war on drugs. He would also support LGBTQ rights as well as drug liberalization. In 2007, he was re-elected to a second term. He would go on to serve on the city council for another five years, after which he decided it was time to take his experience beyond City Hall. I'm Beto O'Rourke and I'm running for U.S. Congress. I was born and raised here in El Paso, Texas. I started a business here and I'm raising my family here. And I was lucky enough- In 2012, Beto entered the Democratic primary to represent Texas 16th Congressional District. He would run against the incumbent who had served eight terms in the office. Beto would ultimately be successful winning 50.5% of the vote. During the general election, his campaign would knock on more than 16,000 doors. The campaign had no paid staff, no paid consultants, and no money for campaign necessities such as flyers or TV ads. Despite these shortcomings, Beto defeated his general election opponent, Republican Barbara Carrasco, with 65% of the vote. As a congressman, Beto crossed the aisle to work with Republican Steve Pierce of New Mexico to introduce legislation that would require the Department of Homeland Security to investigate allegations of violence and civil rights violations by U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents. The bill would also establish standard procedures that border agents would have to use when reporting deaths or the use of force at the border. He co-sponsored legislation that allowed U.S. Customs and Border Protection to partner with the private sector in order to pay overtime for customs officers. This legislation, enacted in 2014, was meant to keep a sufficient number of personnel on duty in order to reduce the wait times at the border. Thanks to Beto, El Paso was one of five cities selected to benefit from this program. In 2015, he was one of six members of Congress who took a six-day trip to Israel that included meetings with Israeli and Palestinian peace negotiators, political leaders, and residents. In 2016, he would win a third term in Congress. A firm believer in term limits, Beto promised not to serve more than three terms in the House of Representatives. Remaining true to his promise, Beto made the decision to not run for re-election in 2018. He set his eyes on a higher prize. 
on March 31st, 2017. He announced his bid to unseat the incumbent Republican Ted Cruz in the United States Senate. From the announcement of his campaign, political pundits considered his chances very slim. The state of Texas hadn't elected a Democrat to statewide office in nearly 25 years. In 2018, Beto became the nominee for the Democratic Party, winning 61.8% of the vote. He pledged not to accept PAC funding or corporate special interest money during his campaign. Thanks to a large number of small donations, his campaign raised $2 million in the first three months. These donations would come from over 800,000 individual contributions. Beto campaigned in all 254 counties in Texas. He would often draw large crowds. Instead of running a traditional Democratic campaign, which often are ran by out-of-touch consultants or posters, his campaign would rely heavily on volunteers and building out a strong digital presence. His first ad in the campaign was filmed on an iPhone. He would also allow for an unprecedented amount of transparency posting frequently on social media, and live streaming not only his campaign stops, but also personal activities, such as doing laundry, grabbing food, or interfacing with his constituents. A number of his posts and videos would go viral. One such post included Beto discussing his feelings about NFL athletes taking a knee to address police brutality against African American men. Peaceful, nonviolent protests, including taking a knee at a football game to point out that black men unarmed, black teenagers unarmed, and black children unarmed are being killed at a frightening level right now, including by members of law enforcement, without accountability and without justice. And this problem, as grave as it is, is not going to fix itself. And they're frustrated, frankly, with people like me and those in positions of public trust and power who have been unable to resolve this or bring justice for what has been done and to stop it from continuing to happen in this country. And so nonviolently, peacefully, while the eyes of this country are watching these games, they take a knee to bring our attention and our focus to this problem to ensure that we fix it. That is why they are doing it. And I can think of nothing more American than to peacefully stand up or take a knee for your rights anytime, anywhere. Many saw Beto as a throwback to the Kennedys and likened his run for the Senate to Bobby Kennedy's 1968 presidential run. Others would draw comparisons between his campaign for the Senate to Barack Obama's 2008 campaign for president, noting their similar speaking styles, charisma, and optimistic messages as highly attractive to a young and diverse voting bloc. During the course of his campaign, Beto would receive endorsements from prominent newspapers in Texas and even drew the support of many unsuspecting characters from within and outside of Texas. One of the first celebrity endorsements came from singer-slash-activist Willie Nelson, who held a rally in support of Beto in Austin, Texas. A huge surprise came on November 6th, Election Day, when superstar and Houston, Texas native Beyonce Knowles Carter shared a picture on Instagram of her wearing a Beto for Senate campaign baseball hat. Other celebrity endorsements included Travis Scott, Ellen DeGeneres, LeBron James, Eva Longoria, Jim Carrey, and Kelly Rowland, to name a few. Despite the momentum, celebrity endorsements, and comparisons to Barack Obama and Bobby Kennedy, it wasn't enough to overcome the odds and become the Democratic senator in the deeply Republican state of Texas. Although the race was incredibly tight, Beto was ultimately defeated by Senator Ted Cruz, with Beto winning 48.3% of the vote against Cruz's 50.9%. I'm as inspired, I'm as hopeful as I have ever been in my life. And tonight's loss does nothing to diminish the way that I feel about Texas or this country. I want to thank this amazing 
campaign of people, not a dime from a single pack, all people, all the time, in every single part of Texas. Despite his loss, Beto remained upbeat and optimistic. After all, his campaign for the Senate proved that, while difficult, it is not entirely impossible for Democrats to be competitive statewide in Texas. His campaign would amass more than 4 million votes. By comparison, Hillary Clinton received 3.9 million votes in Texas during the 2016 presidential election. For Democrats, Beto's run put the state of Texas back into play for 2020. Following his defeat, he would signal to his supporters that this was not the end of his journey. What's next for Beto O'Rourke's future remains to be seen. It also remains to be seen whether or not the momentum built up during his Senate campaign will sustain. Some on the left are skeptical that Beto's political bona fides don't pass the progressive smell test. Others see him as the perfect foil to President Trump, a young, charismatic, fresh face with rock star qualities who can appeal to a diverse democratic coalition. Whichever version of Beto emerges in the final analysis, the impact he's had in shaping the imagination of millions of Democrats hoping for change is in itself an undeniable feat.